Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Sports End History Story. This week is another in the Tales from the Past and this is video number 14. I do know that I have done quite a few of these recently but I do still have quite a lot of family issues going on at the moment and these kind of stories are a little easier for me to research but I am hoping to do some more in-depth videos very soon. As always, this one will be about various different stories about people or places from the past or just things that happened in the Wall's End area. And they will be from various different years and in no particular order. And some stories may be a little longer than others. I hope you will enjoy it and find it interesting. In 1898, an open air service was held at Holy Cross Ruins. At this time, the church was open and not fenced in, so the churchyard would have stretched much further around the top of the bank than it does today. It was said at the time that a huge congregation had gathered to take part in the service. Of course, by 1898, the ruins at Holy Cross were no longer used, as St Peter's had been built several years before, in 1809 to be precise, to replace the ruins. But in 1898, it was feared the ruins were being neglected, and it was hoped that perhaps a regular service could be held here to help preserve the chapel ruins and the churchyard. Now, I don't really know if the regular services did take place, but by the early 1900s, the ruins had a fence around them, making them a much smaller area to look after. And the fence, as most of you will know, remains in place today. But whether or not it's the original fence is hard to say, but it probably is. The fence posts, I mean by that, obviously. But thankfully... The hopes of those involved in 1898 were realised because the ruins are still there today and are, as I have mentioned before, Grade 1 listed. And the fence now and the gate is normally all secure so people can't get inside as easily as they could before. But this wasn't the first time that the care of the chapel ruins had been mentioned in the local papers. In 1894, Unemployment was quite bad in Wall's End and many people were struggling to find work to support their families and the relief fund was not able to constantly support these families so it was hoped that the church may employ some of the men to do work on Holy Cross ruins to clean and take care of the headstones and the remains of the chapel itself. It seems that this was agreed to however it doesn't sadly seem to have been a job that would have lasted for very long but at least some of the families would have had employment for a short while and hopefully by the time the church cleaning work ended things may have improved and they would have been able to find work again. I would just like to add that the relief fund in 1894 had a total of £11.18.06 to divide between 68 families. And this wasn't a regular payment and the families would be expected to make the small amount they received last as long as possible and hope that work would soon be found. It is often easy to forget that although the town at the time had shipyards, collieries and many shops on the high street, work was still not always easy to find for some of the people of the town. And it must have been ter a terrifying thought for many people that if they could not find work, they and their families may find themselves in one of the local workhouses. It seems that you could be found in the past for what seemed to be very quite simple things. In 1894, William, who was a hawker, which is just someone who sells things, maybe in local streets or on a market stall, was fined five shillings for not keeping control of his horse and cart. There is no evidence to suggest that the horse and cart were actually causing a problem, but William had been found in Stevenson Street in a public house, drinking and playing dominoes while his horse and cart were left unattended outside, and this was enough to see him sent to court and fined. Of course, there had been some cases of runaway horses and carts as well, so I guess they were taking no chances and making sure people knew that they couldn't just leave them in the street where the horse might take fright and run away. In 1892, Dr. Wilson was complaining about the fact that many houses in Wall's End still had ash pits. 
He said these houses were also the ones built back to back, so diseases spread easily from these unsanitary ash pits. It was noted that houses built in Moore's End in the past four to five years had been built with box closets, or in other words, a kind of outside toilet, though not still quite like the outside toilets most of us would remember today, and more like an enclosed ash pit. Dr Wilson said he would like to see all the ash pits replaced with box closets for the sake of the health of the people of Wall's End. And it was then pointed out to him that some 12 months earlier, letters had been left at all the homes with ash pits offering them the chance to have the new box closets. However, only one person had taken up the offer. Which does not really surprise me, seeing as the board had also told those living in the houses that they would need to pay for the work themselves and that payments would need to be made for the next six years. Of course, the board did not have an unlimited supply of money, but the houses with ash pits were likely to be the homes to the more poorer people of Wall's End, and expecting them to pay for their new loos was probably something well beyond most of their means. Dr Wilson said he still felt the board should really cover the cost, which it was stated would be around £2 per closet with 500 homes needing the work to be done, and this would work out at around £163,000 in today's money. And it seems that this was not going to happen as the board did not want to pay. It was then suggested that the board should insist that no new houses built in the town should be allowed to have ash pits. However, the board said they could not make this ruling either. And in the end, it was decided that letters would be sent out again, hoping that this time more people would take up the offer. Though I somehow don't think that this would have worked any better than the original letters that had been sent out previously in the, the 12 months before this. But... Eventually, ash pits would all vanish and the outside flushing toilet would eventually take their place. In 1936, talks were underway to change the layout of the village green. It was hoped that fences and gates could be put in place to stop people walking over the grass, which was felt was spoiling it by too many people walking on it and creating trodden down paths. They also planned to create borders and flower beds and add seating areas along with a possible children's corner. Although they did not actually go into detail about that part, so it's not clear if they planned to add swings and the likes, but I assume that would be what they had hoped for. They felt this would make the area more attractive and a place where people could go and sit on summer nights. They never really talked of how high the fences and gates were going to be that they planned to put in place, but they thought most of the proposals would be adopted. However, as you can see from the photos that have been on screen, no borders were created and no fences and gates were put in place. So, although there was no follow-up to the story, we have to assume that the people of Wall's End didn't like the proposed plans. And the subject of how to take care of the village green would, however, rumble on for many more years. But, thankfully, it never ended up fenced off with gates, as I actually think that would have looked quite awful. The final story this week is a slightly longer one than the others, and it is in June of 1900. A visitor came to see Wall's End and our new park, which at the time wasn't officially open, but of course people were still allowed to go in. The visitor, who does not give their name, is not best impressed with either Wall's End or the park, so I think it's probably a good thing that they didn't give their name. However, I thought I would mention what they said, as it kind of shows how even back then, people were happy to write articles that would no doubt upset people, most likely in the hope of selling more papers. The author started by saying that they felt Wall's End was growing too quickly and that it didn't have a real centre with shops and houses just springing up all over the place. But they should have waited and come back later as the town did end up being much more structured in the years to come. And one thing that made me smile at the start of the author's article was when they were looking for the park. No signposts, etc. back then, so they had to ask those on Walls End High Street. The first man they asked said he didn't really know, but it might be at the end of the row they were standing on. 
and the second man, who was described by the article writer as standing with his hands in his pockets holding up a wall, said he thought it might be at the top of one of those streets there, pointing randomly in, it seems, the right direction. It was probably worth noting that it wasn't really a small park even then, so those two men should really have known where it was, but maybe they didn't play tennis or bowls or go for walks, so hadn't taken much notice, but luckily the author did find it in the end. And on entering the park, our unhappy author said it was slowly being surrounded by red brick buildings, which they believed would eventually surround the park completely, which of course they did, as the town grew and more homes were needed. But they thought these houses were ugly, which is probably another good reason not to mention your name when you're busy pulling a town apart. It was noted that even though it was June, the flowers and trees were a little behind this year, so all the new plants in the park were not yet in bloom, and as the day they visited was dull and miserable, this, they thought, made the park look the same. They were glad, however, that some of the original trees on the land had been saved, even if they did feel that one down beside the lake was a bit of a weird shape. Thankfully, the author was not entirely rude about our new park. In fact, they were rather impressed with the lawn tennis courts and the beautifully laid out bowling greens. And they actually said that those would be any bowler's dream. They didn't think much, however, of the bandstand, which wasn't quite completed at the time and they felt the area was too open to the winds. But of course, the trees had not grown yet, so it would not have been quite so sheltered. They went as far as to say that they thought the bandstand might have been better on the island in the middle of the lake, which I thought was a rather strange thing to suggest. But they did feel that the lake was a nice feature and that it was really good idea that some of the land had been set aside to create a children's play area, and they also hoped that the council might be able to acquire the land next to the park, better known to us today as the whole grounds, to make the area even better. So in the end, they decided that the park wasn't as bad as they first thought, and that by the time the trees and flowers had grown, it would be quite a nice place. And they did think that the gift of the land by Robert Richards and Dees was indeed a good one. They ended their note by discussing how on entering the park you could still see the shaft of the old pit that used to stand on the land and how while working on the park the foundations of Pit Row had been found and the old well. And I'm still not quite certain where the old well was. I have an idea but I'm not completely certain. But maybe someone listening knows where it was for sure. I have no plans to dig it up though, I'm just curious to know exactly where it was in the park. I do hope that you have enjoyed these little stories and found them interesting and I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon. <laughs>